Our next reading for our creation unit, our final two readings, are going to be some modern works. Uh, we're going to take a look at um, a piece of a novel written by um, a writer named Daniel Quinn, who has a, a nice Houston location. He actually um, lives down, uh, he passed away recently, but he lived down in the St. Thomas area, which is in Houston, off uh, near the Arts District in St. Thomas University. Um, so I had the uh, interesting, I guess, privilege of listening to one of his lectures and bringing some students there while he was still uh, at work with it, and he's, he's quite an interesting uh, fellow. But um, he wrote this book called Ishmael, and in the course of that book, uh, embedded in it is a retelling of the creation story, the story of Adam and Eve, and also the story of Cain and Abel. And so our, our work with this is going to be reading that excerpt, which takes up some, I don't know, dozen or so pages. Um, but as we take a look at it, what I'm going to have you do after you read it is you're going to be answering these five questions about, um, about the work and what you think it has to say uh, as far as how you might connect it to Genesis and how you think this author is interpreting the story. So as you read, if you want to look at the questions and have them in mind uh, as you search for kind of the answers for these questions, uh, that would probably be handy for you. Um, so just a little bit about Daniel Quinn and what this idea is. Um, the story is very odd. It begins with an ad advertisement uh, in a local newspaper um, that someone is answering. And our, our narrator of sorts is kind of an out-of-luck guy. He's uh, a highly educated young man but he, he's kind of floundering. He doesn't quite know what to do. And he, he's looking through the one ads. And he finds an advertisement that's there that says, um, teacher seeks pupil, must have an earnest desire to save the world. Apply in person. And then there's an address. And the address is kind of in the seedy part of town. But um, our narrator gets there. And he comes to an abandoned office building. And um, he notices that the name Ishmael is written on one of the address tags so he enters and he finds the office but uh, the door is open and the place is a wreck it looks like it's been abandoned for some time um, and so he's about to leave realizing that this is some big mistake when he hears a voice that says no don't leave I'm in the back room and so thinking it's kind of odd the narrator you know works his way through the trash and gets into the back room and he enters in and he sees in the middle of this room is a cage and inside the cage is a giant old silverback gorilla. Um, and he thinks this is too weird, so he steps out and he's leaving. He has no clue why there's a gorilla in the middle of this abandoned office building, but he's ready to get out of there when a voice speaks to him again and says, please don't leave, I think we need to talk. And it turns out that it's the gorilla that is communicating telepathically with him. So it's kind of a hokey device to get you interested. It is a setup. Um, but in a way, this gorilla is going to serve the role as a wise Socrates, who's going to ask his young tutor a series of questions in order to evolve him to uh, a set of knowledge and, and, a, and a place of wisdom. Um, and so to get a little bit of where Quinn is coming from, you should know he's written several books. And uh, Quinn is a bit of an environmentalist. Um, he talks a lot about culture and how mother culture has a way of affecting us. Um, and one of the things that he addresses is this idea of a, a boiling frog. And so he asks the question, how do you boil a frog alive? And, um, you know, because if you think about it, if you put a frog into hot boiling water, the frog's going to react and immediately jump out. So you'll just make a mess of it. Um, if you knock the frog out, it kind of defeats the purpose. And so uh, what he says is what you do to boil a frog alive is you put it into very nice warm water, but not hot. The frog is quite comfortable, will stay in the water, and then you gradually turn the heat up. It's kind of akin to when you, uh, you take a shower and you slowly, incrementally turn the water hotter and hotter. Um, if you were to try to enter the shower when it was too hot, you wouldn't be able to stand it. But little by little, you grow used to it. And what Quinn's point is that when we think about things like institutional change and individual change, these things happen gradually. Um, for example, we're in the cusp of a 
a changeover from the fossil fuel industry into more green sources. Um, and you see some of the pain of that change as people kind of want to jump out of the tub uh, because it's too much too soon. Um, but it is something that eventually will have to happen. And so if that change is going to take place peacefully, it needs to be a gradual change. And this idea that uh, Quinn is on to is that mother culture is that part of our upbringing that um, sets the stage for our belief systems. Mother culture is what trains us for what is right and what is wrong. And that diet is fed through the media, okay? It's fed through our families, it's threat fed through our friends, but largely it's fed through the culture that we encounter. And little by little they re reinforce certain norms of behavior um, which we become, we come to find as acceptable, okay? Um, we have this common heritage. And so what Quinn points out and what the purpose of Ishmael is, is it sets up one of the earliest norms that's established and that is the story of the Garden of Eden and the story of Adam and Eve, okay? And then he will take us through this little tour. Um, some other things that Quinn is famous for saying is uh, one of the ideas, population. Uh, in one of his books, he'll talk about how the way to handle the, the problem of starvation is to let people starve to death. Uh, and under his view, population uh, populations tend to only produce enough people that they have food to feed. And so you notice in primitive cultures, they did not have large families because large families would be problematic. And so the smaller the, uh, the future, the smaller the food supply, the smaller the families. And so his situation is if we don't feed people, if we don't provide a ready resource, then those families through time will certainly find a way to have smaller smaller families and therefore are fewer problems as they move into it. If you're interested in any of these ideas, you can certainly uh, explore them through these. I have these uh, links here to these gap minder that talk about the population pro problem. All right. Now, one of the more interesting theories that um, Quinn proposes is this idea of a, um, a lever and a taker. And he'll talk about this as being a mindset, the idea of the group of people who feels like when they use a place they want to leave the least amount of footprint and basically if you cut a tree down you plant two in its place versus the takers whose mentality is it's mine to use, um, why should I worry about the future? Um, it's a very eco-friendly solution. Um, it seems to have this idealistic view that the hunter-gatherers of the past seem to have had the right um, lifestyle and that we have lost that lifestyle and lost that mentality. Um, what Quinn seems to be forgetting is the hunter-gatherer lifestyle was very difficult um, and was very time-consuming. Uh, in order to consume enough calories to continue your day, sometimes these foragers, these hunters, these gatherers would have to travel long distances to try to find a food supply, often putting them in competition with others. And so it wasn't an idealized way of life, uh, but it should be something we need to, to think about because it seems like we always seem to be facing the same problems of population control, of food scarcity, okay, and how we're going to match those two uh, together. It's not a problem we've actually found a way to solve uh, in any kind of conclusive way, okay. So as you read this uh, story, I want you to pay attention to what are levers and takers? Who is he identifying as Eve? Is this figure about two individuals or are we talking about two types of people or rather groups, or as Quinn likes to talk about, the lifestyle that they might represent, okay? Same thing, who are Cain and Abel, okay? And then according to him, what is this temptation? What is the fruit and why? What is the purpose of all of this uh, that Quinn is doing? What is he trying to accomplish? So it's an interesting read. Go ahead and, uh, and give it a read. And again, what you're gonna do as you kind of read through this is focus on answering those four questions or those five questions that I've kind of set out for you um, 
at the beginning stage of this video. So why do you believe the overall purpose of this version of Genesis to be? According to Ishmael, who composed the story? How does the author interpret the story of Cain and Abel? How does the author explain the fall? Um, and then finally, what do you think of the interpretation? What are your likes? What are your dislikes? What are the issues that you might have with it?